Chapter Five: The Dead World. I remember that we all sat gasping in our chairs with that sweet, wet southwestern breeze, fresh from the sea, flapping the muslin curtains and cooling our flushed faces. I wonder how long we sat. None of us afterwards could agree at all on that point. We were bewildered, stunned, semi-conscious. We had all braced our courage for death, but this fearful and sudden new fact that we must continue to live after we had survived the race to which we belonged struck us with the shock of a physical blow and left us prostrate. Then gradually the suspended mechanism began to move once more. The shuttles of memory worked. Ideas weaved themselves together in our minds. We saw with vivid, merciless clearness the relations between the past, the present, and the future, the lives that we had led, and the lives which we would have to live. Our eyes turned in silent horror upon those of our companions, and found the same answering look in theirs. Instead of the joy which men might have expected to feel, who had so narrowly escaped an imminent death, a terrible wave of darkest depression submerged us. Everything on earth that we loved had been washed away into the great, infinite, unknown ocean, and here were we marooned upon this desert island of a world, without companions, hopes, or aspirations. A few years skulking like jackals among the graves of the human race, and then our belated and lonely end would come. "'It's dreadful, George, dreadful!' the lady cried, in an agony of sobs. "'If we had only passed with the others! Oh, why did you save us? I feel as if it is we that are dead and everyone else alive!' Challenger's great eyebrows were drawn down in concentrated thought, while his huge, hairy paw closed upon the outstretched hand of his wife. I had observed that she always held out her arms to him in trouble as a child would to its mother." "'Without being a fatalist to the point of non-resistance,' said he, "'I have always found that the highest wisdom lies in an acquiescence with the actual.' He spoke slowly, and there was a vibration of feeling in his sonorous voice. "'I do not acquiesce,' said Summerlee firmly. "'I don't see that it matters a row of pins whether you acquiesce or whether you don't,' remarked Lord John. You've got to take it, whether you take it fightin' or take it lyin' down. So what's the odds whether you acquiesce or not? I can't remember that anyone asked our permission before the thing began, and nobody's likely to ask it now. So what difference can it make what we think of it? It's just all the difference between happiness and misery, said Challenger with an abstracted face, still patting his wife's hand. You can swim with the tide and have peace in mind and soul, or you can thrust against it and be bruised and weary. This business is beyond us, so let us accept it as it stands and say no more. "'But what in the world are we to do with our lives?' I asked, appealing in desperation to the blue empty heaven. "'What am I to do, for example? There are no newspapers, so there's an end of my vocation.' and there's nothing left to shoot, and no more soldiering, so there's an end of mine, said Lord John. And there are no students, so there's an end of mine, cried Summerlee. But I have my husband and my house, so I can thank heaven that there is no end of mine, said the lady. Nor is there an end of mine, remarked Challenger, for science is not dead and this catastrophe in itself will offer us many most absorbing problems for investigation. He had now flung open the windows, and we were gazing out upon the silent and motionless landscape. "'Let me consider,' he continued. "'It was about three, or a little after, yesterday afternoon, that the world finally entered the poison belt to the extent of being completely submerged. It is now nine o'clock.' The question is, at what hour did we pass out from it? The air was very bad at daybreak, said I. Later than that, said Mrs. Challenger, as late as eight o'clock I distinctly felt the same choking at my throat which came at the outset. 
then we shall say that it passed just after eight o'clock. For seventeen hours the world has been soaked in the poisonous ether. For that length of time the great gardener has sterilized the human mold which had grown over the surface of his fruit. Is it possible that the work is incompletely done, that others may have survived besides ourselves? That's what I was wondering, said Lord John. Why should we be the only pebbles on the beach? It is absurd to suppose that anyone besides ourselves can possibly have survived, said Summerlee with conviction. Consider that the poison was so virulent that even a man who is as strong as an ox and has not a nerve in his body, like Malone here, could hardly get up the stairs before he fell unconscious. Is it likely that anyone could stand seventeen minutes of it, far less hours? Unless someone saw it coming and made preparation, same as old friend Challenger did. That, I think, is hardly probable, said Challenger, projecting his beard and sinking his eyelids. The combination of observation, inference, and anticipatory imagination which enabled me to foresee the danger is what one could hardly expect twice in the same generation. Then your conclusion is that everyone is certainly dead? There can be little doubt of that. We have to remember, however, that the poison worked from below upwards, and would possibly be less virulent at the higher strata of the atmosphere. It is strange indeed that it should be so, but it presents one of those features which will afford us in the future a fascinating field for study. One could imagine, therefore, that if one had to search for survivors, one would turn one's eyes with best hopes of success to some Tibetan village or some alpine farm, many thousands of feet above the sea level. Well, considering that there are no railroads and no steamers, you might as well talk about survivors in the moon, said Lord John. But what I'm asking myself is whether it's really over or whether it's only half-time. Summerlee craned his neck to look round the horizon. It seems clear and fine, said he in a very dubious voice. But so it did yesterday. I am by no means assured that it is all over. Challenger shrugged his shoulders. We must come back once more to our fatalism said he. If the world has undergone this experience before, which is not outside the range of possibility, it was certainly a very long time ago. Therefore, we may reasonably hope that it will be very long before it occurs again. That's all very well, said Lord John, but if you get an earthquake shock, you are mighty likely to have a second one right on the top of it. I think we'd be wise to stretch our legs and have a breath of air while we have the chance. Since our oxygen is exhausted, we may just as well be caught outside as in. It was strange the absolute lethargy which had come upon us as a reaction, after our tremendous emotions of the last twenty-four hours. It was both mental and physical, a deep-lying feeling that nothing mattered, and that everything was a weariness and a profitless exertion. Even Challenger has succumbed to it, and sat in his chair, with his great head leaning upon his hands and his thoughts far away, until Lord John and I, catching him by each arm, fairly lifted him on to his feet, receiving only the glare and growl of an angry mastiff for our trouble. However, once we had got out of our narrow haven of refuge into the wider atmosphere of everyday life, our normal energy came gradually back to us once more. But what were we to begin to do in that graveyard of a world? Could ever men have been faced with such a question since the dawn of time? It is true that our own physical needs, and even our luxuries, were assured for the future. All the stores of food, all the vintages of wine, all the treasures of art were ours for the taking. But what were we to do? Some few tasks appealed to us at once, since they lay ready to our hands. We descended into the kitchen and laid the two domestics upon their respective beds. They seemed to have died without suffering, one in the chair by the fire, 
the other upon the scullery floor. Then we carried in poor Austin from the yard. His muscles were set as hard as a board in the most exaggerated rigor mortis, while the contraction of the fibres had drawn his mouth into a hard sardonic grin. The symptom was prevalent among all those who had died from the poison. Wherever we went we were confronted by those grinning faces, which seemed to mock at our dreadful position, smiling silently and grimly at the ill-fated survivors of their race. "'Look here!' said Lord John, who had paced restlessly about the dining-room whilst we partook of some food. "'I don't know how you fellows feel about it, but for my part I simply can't sit here and do nothing.' "'Perhaps,' Challenger answered, "'you would have the kindness to suggest what you think we ought to do.' "'Get a move on us, and see all that has happened.' "'That is what I should myself propose.' but not in this little country village. We can see from the window all that this place can teach us. Where should we go, then? To London. That's all very well, grumbled Summerlee. You may be equal to a forty-mile walk, but I'm not so sure about Challenger with his stumpy legs, and I am perfectly sure about myself. Challenger was very much annoyed. If you could see your way, sir, to confining your remarks to your own physical peculiarities, you would find that you had an ample field for comment, he cried. I had no intention to offend you, my dear challenger, cried our tactless friend. You can't be held responsible for your own physique. If nature had given you a short, heavy body, you cannot possibly help having stumpy legs. Challenger was too furious to answer. He could only growl and blink and bristle. Lord John hastened to intervene before the dispute became more violent. "'You talk of walking. Why should we walk?' said he. "'Do you suggest taking a train?' asked Challenger, still simmering. "'What's the matter with the motor-car? Why should we not go in that?' "'I am not an expert,' said Challenger, pulling at his beard reflectively. At the same time, you are right in supposing that the human intellect in its higher manifestations should be sufficiently flexible to turn itself to anything. Your idea is an excellent one, Lord John. I myself will drive you all to London. You will do nothing of the kind, said Summerlee, with decision. No, indeed, George, cried his wife. You only tried once, and you remember how you crashed through the gate of the garage. It was a momentary want of concentration, said Challenger, complacently. You can consider the matter settled. I will certainly drive you all to London. The situation was relieved by Lord John. What's the car? he asked. A twenty-horsepower Humber. "'Why, I've driven one for years,' said he. "'By George!' he nodded. "'I never thought I'd live to take the whole human race in one load. <laughs> There's just room for five, as I remember it. Get your things on, and I'll be ready at the door by ten o'clock.' Sure enough, at the hour named, the car came purring and crackling from the yard with Lord John at the wheel. I took my seat beside him, while the lady— a useful little buffer state, was squeezed in between the two men of wrath at the back. Then Lord John released his brakes, slid his lever rapidly from first to third, and we sped off upon the strangest drive that ever human beings have taken since man first came upon the earth. You are to picture the loveliness of nature upon that August day, the freshness of the morning air, the golden glare of the summer sunshine, the cloudless sky, the luxuriant green of the Sussex woods, and the deep purple of heather-clad downs. As you looked round upon the many-coloured beauty of the scene, all thought of a vast catastrophe would have passed from your mind had it not been for one sinister sign, the solemn, all-embracing silence. There is a gentle hum of life which pervades a closely settled country, so deep and constant that one ceases to observe it, 
as the dweller by the sea loses all sense of the constant murmur of the waves. The twitter of birds, the buzz of insects, the far-off echo of voices, the lowing of cattle, the distant barking of dogs, roar of trains, and rattle of carts, all these form one low, unremitting note, striking unheeded upon the ear. We missed it now. This deadly silence was appalling. So solemn was it, so impressive, that the buzz and rattle of our motor-car seemed an unwarrantable intrusion, an indecent disregard of this reverent stillness which lay like a pall over and round the ruins of humanity. It was this grim hush, and the tall clouds of smoke which rose here and there over the countryside from smouldering buildings, which cast a chill into our hearts as we gazed round at the glorious panorama of the Weald. And then there were the dead. At first those endless groups of drawn and grinning faces filled us with a shuddering horror. So vivid and mordant was the impression that I can live over again that slow descent of the station hill, the passing by the nurse-girl with the two babies, the sight of the old horse on his knees between the shafts, the cabman twisted across the seat, and the young man inside with his hand upon the open door, in the very act of springing out. Lower down were six reapers, all in a litter, their limbs crossing, their dead, unwinking eyes gazing upwards at the glare of heaven. These things I see as in a photograph. But soon, by the merciful provision of nature, the over-excited nerves ceased to respond. The very vastness of the horror took away from its personal appeal. Individuals merged into groups, groups into crowds, crowds into a universal phenomenon which one soon accepted as the inevitable detail of every scene. Only here and there, where some particularly brutal or grotesque incident caught the attention, did the mind come back with a sudden shock to the personal and human meaning of it all. Above all there was the fate of the children, that, I remember, filled us with the strongest sense of intolerable injustice. We could have wept. Mrs. Challenger did weep, when we passed a great council school and saw the long trail of tiny figures scattered down the road which led from it. They had been dismissed by their terrified teachers and were speeding for their homes when the poison caught them in its net. Great numbers of people were at the open windows of the houses, in Tunbridge Wells there was hardly one which had not its staring, smiling face. At the last instant the need of air, that very craving for oxygen which we alone had been able to satisfy, had sent them flying to the window. The sidewalks, too, were littered with men and women, hatless and bonnetless, who had rushed out of the houses. Many of them had fallen in the roadway. It was a lucky thing that in Lord John we found an expert driver, for it was no easy matter to pick one's way. Passing through the villages or towns we could only go at a walking pace, and once, I remember, opposite the school at Tunbridge, we had to halt some time while we carried aside the bodies which blocked our path. A few small, definite pictures stand out in my memory from amid that long panorama of death upon the Sussex and Kentish high roads. One was that of a great glittering motor-car, standing outside the inn at the village of Southborough. It bore, as I should guess, some pleasure-party upon their return from Brighton, or from Eastbourne. There were three gaily-dressed women, all young and beautiful, one of them with a Peking spaniel upon her lap. With them were a rakish-looking elderly man and a young aristocrat, his eyeglass still in his eye, his cigarette burned down to the stub between the fingers of his begloved hand. Death must have come on them in an instant, and fixed them as they sat, save that the elderly man had at the last moment torn out his collar in an effort to breathe, they might all have been asleep. On one side of the car a waiter, with some broken glasses beside a tray, was huddled near the step. On the other, two very ragged tramps, a man and a woman, lay where they had fallen, the man with his long, thin arms still outstretched, even as he had asked for alms in his lifetime. 
one instant of time had put aristocrat, waiter, tramp, and dog upon one common footing of inert and dissolving protoplasm. I remember another singular picture, some miles on the London side of Seven Oaks. There was a large convent upon the left, with a long green slope in front of it. Upon this slope were assembled a great number of school-children, all kneeling at prayer. In front of them was a fringe of nuns, and higher up the slope, facing towards them, a single figure whom we took to be the Mother Superior. Unlike the pleasure-seekers in the motor-car, these people seemed to have had warning of their danger, and to have died beautifully together, the teachers and the taught, assembled for their last common lesson. My mind is still stunned by that terrific experience, and I grope vainly for means of expression by which I can reproduce the emotions which we felt. Perhaps it is best and wisest not to try, but merely to indicate the facts. Even Summerlee and Challenger were crushed, and we heard nothing of our companions behind us save an occasional whimper from the lady. As to Lord John, he was too intent upon his wheel, and the difficult task of threading his way along such roads to have time or inclination for conversation. One phrase he used with such wearisome iteration that it stuck in my memory, and at last almost made me laugh as a comment upon the day of doom. "'Pretty doings! What?' That was his ejaculation as each fresh, tremendous combination of death and disaster displayed itself before us. "'Pretty doings! What?' he cried, as we descended the station hill at Rutherford, and it was still, "'Pretty doings! What?' as we picked our way through a wilderness of death in the high street of Lewisham and the old Kent Road. It was here that we received a sudden and amazing shock. Out of the window of a humble corner-house there appeared a fluttering handkerchief waving at the end of a long, thin human arm. Never had the sight of unexpected death caused our hearts to stop and then throb so wildly as this amazing indication of life. Lord John ran the motor to the curb, and in an instant we had rushed through the open door of the house and up the staircase to the second-floor front room from which the signal proceeded. A very old lady sat in a chair by the open window, and, close to her, laid across a second chair, was a cylinder of oxygen, smaller but of the same shape as those which had saved our own lives. She turned her thin, drawn, bespectacled face toward us as we crowded in at the doorway. "'I feared that I was abandoned here for ever,' said she, "'for I am an invalid and cannot stir.' "'Well, madam,' Challenger answered, "'it is a lucky chance that we happen to pass.' "'I have one all-important question to ask you,' said she. "'Gentlemen, I beg that you will be frank with me. "'What effect will these effects have upon London?' and Northwestern Railway shares. We should have laughed had it not been for the tragic eagerness with which she listened for our answer. Mrs. Burston, for that was her name, was an aged widow, whose whole income depended upon a small holding of this stock. Her life had been regulated by the rise and fall of the dividend, and she could form no conception of existence, save as it was affected by the quotation of her shares. In vain we pointed out to her that all the money in the world was hers for the taking, and was useless when taken. Her old mind would not adapt itself to the new idea, and she wept loudly over her vanished stock. "'It was all I had,' she wailed. "'And if that is gone I may as well go too.' Amid her lamentations we found out how this frail old plant had lived where the hull great forest had fallen. She was a confirmed invalid and an asthmatic. Oxygen had been prescribed for her malady, and a tube was in her room at the moment of the crisis. She had naturally inhaled some, as had been her habit when there was a difficulty with her breathing. It had given her relief, and by doling out her supply she had managed to survive the night. Finally she had fallen asleep and been awakened by the buzz of our motor-car. As it was impossible to take her on with us, 
We saw that she had all her necessaries of life, and promised to communicate with her in a couple of days at the latest. So we left her, still weeping bitterly over her vanished stock. As we approached the Thames, the block in the streets became thicker, and the obstacles more bewildering. It was with difficulty that we made our way across London Bridge. The approaches to it upon the Middlesex side were choked from end to end with frozen traffic, which made all further advance in that direction impossible. A ship was blazing brightly alongside one of the wharves near the bridge, and the air was full of drifting smuts and of a heavy acrid smell of burning. There was a cloud of dense smoke somewhere near the Houses of Parliament, but it was impossible from where we were to see what was on fire. "'I don't know how it strikes you,' Lord John remarked, as he brought his engine to a standstill. "'But it seems to me the country is more cheerful than the town. Dead London is getting on my nerves. I'm for a cast round and then getting back to Rotherfield.' "'I confess that I do not see what we can hope for here.' said Professor Summerlee. "'At the same time,' said Challenger, his great voice booming strangely amid the silence, "'it is difficult for us to conceive that out of seven millions of people there is only this one old woman, who by some peculiarity of constitution, or some accident of occupation, has managed to survive this catastrophe.' "'If there should be others, how can we hope to find them, George?' asked the lady. "'And yet I agree with you that we cannot go back until we have tried.' Getting out of the car, and leaving it by the curb, we walked with some difficulty across the crowded pavement of King William Street, and entered the open door of a large insurance office. It was a corner house, and we chose it as commanding a view in every direction. Ascending the stair, we passed through what I supposed to have been the boardroom, for eight elderly men were seated round a long table in the centre of it. The high window was open, and we all stepped out upon the balcony. From it we could see the crowded city streets, radiating in every direction, while below us the road was black, from side to side, with the tops of the motionless taxis. All, or nearly all, had their heads pointed outwards, showing how the terrified men of the city had at the last moment made a vain endeavour to rejoin their families in the suburbs or the country. Here and there amid the humbler cabs towered the great brass-spangled motor-car of some wealthy magnet, wedged hopelessly among the damned stream of arrested traffic. Just beneath us there was such a one of great size and luxurious appearance, with its owner, a fat old man, leaning out, half his gross body through the window and his podgy hand, gleaming with diamonds, outstretched as he urged his chauffeur to make a last effort to break through the press. A dozen motor-buses towered up like islands in this flood, the passengers who crowded the roofs lying all huddled together and across each other's laps, like a child's toys in a nursery. On a broad lamp pedestal, in the centre of the roadway, a burly policeman was standing, leaning his back against the post in so natural an attitude that it was hard to realize that he was not alive, while at his feet there lay a ragged newsboy with his bundle of papers on the ground beside him. A paper-cart had got blocked in the crowd, and we could read in large letters, black upon yellow, SEEN AT LORDS, COUNTY MATCH INTERRUPTED. This must have been the earliest edition, for there were other placards bearing the legend, IS IT THE END? Great scientist's warning, and another, is Challenger justified? Ominous rumors. Challenger pointed the latter placard out to his wife as it thrust itself like a banner above the throng. I could see him throw out his chest and stroke his beard as he looked at it. It pleased and flattered that complex mind to think that London had died with his name and his words still present in their thoughts. His feelings were so evident that they aroused the sardonic comment of his colleague. "'In the limelight to the last, Challenger,' he remarked. "'So it would appear,' he answered complacently. "'Well,' he added as he looked down the long vista of the radiating streets, all silent and all choked up with death, 
I really see no purpose to be served by our staying any longer in London. I suggest that we return at once to Rotherfield, and then take counsel as to how we shall most profitably employ the years which lie before us. Only one other picture shall I give of the scenes which we carried back in our memories from the dead city. It is a glimpse which we had of the interior of the old church of St. Mary's, which is at the very point where our car was awaiting us. Picking our way among the prostrate figures upon the steps, we pushed open the swing door and entered. It was a wonderful sight. The church was crammed from end to end with kneeling figures in every posture of supplication and abasement. At the last dreadful moment, brought suddenly face to face with the realities of life, those terrific realities which hang over us even while we follow the shadows, the terrified people had rushed into these old city churches which for generations had hardly ever held a congregation. There they huddled as close as they could kneel, many of them in their agitation still wearing their hats, while above them in the pulpit a young man in lay dress had apparently been addressing them when he and they had been overwhelmed by the same fate. He lay now, like Punch in his booth, with his head and two limp arms hanging over the ledge of the pulpit. It was a nightmare, the grey, dusty church, the rows of agonized figures, the dimness and silence of it all. We moved about with hushed whispers, walking upon our tiptoes. And then suddenly I had an idea. At one corner of the church, near the door, stood the ancient font, and behind it a deep recess in which there hung the ropes for the bell-ringers. Why should we not send a message out over London which would attract to us any one who might still be alive? I ran across, and pulling at the list-covered rope, I was surprised to find how difficult it was to swing the bell. Lord John had followed me. "'By George, young fella,' said he, pulling off his coat, "'you've hit on a deuced good notion. Give me a grip, and we'll soon have a move on it.' But, even then, so heavy was the bell that it was not until Challenger and Summerlee had added their weight to ours, that we heard the roaring and clanging above our heads, which told us that the great clapper was ringing out its music. Far over dead London resounded our message of comradeship and hope to any fellow-man surviving. It cheered our own hearts, that strong metallic call, and we turned the more earnestly to our work, dragged two feet off the earth with each upward jerk of the rope, but all straining together on the downward heave, Challenger the lowest of all, bending all his great strength to the task, and flopping up and down like a monstrous bullfrog, croaking with every pull. It was at that moment that an artist might have taken a picture of the four adventurers, the comrades of many strange perils in the past, whom fate had now chosen for so supreme an experience. For half an hour we worked, the sweat dropping from our faces, our arms and backs aching with the exertion. Then we went out into the portico of the church and looked eagerly up and down the silent, crowded streets. Not a sound, not a motion, in answer to our summons. "'It's no use! No one is left!' I cried. "'We can do nothing more,' said Mrs. Challenger. "'For God's sake, George, let us get back to Rotherfield. Another hour of this dreadful silent city would drive me mad!' We got into the car without another word. Lord John backed her round and turned her to the south. To us the chapter seemed closed. Little did we foresee the strange new chapter which was to open. CHAPTER Six, THE GREAT AWAKENING And now I come to the end of this extraordinary incident, so overshadowing in its importance not only in our own small, individual lives, but in the general history of the human race. As I said when I began my narrative, when that history comes to be written, this occurrence will surely stand out among all other events, like a mountain towering among its foothills. Our generation has been reserved for a very special fate, since it has been chosen to experience so wonderful a thing. How long its effect may last, how long mankind may preserve the humility and reverence which this great shock has taught it,
can only be shown by the future. I think it is safe to say that things can never be quite the same again. Never can one realize how powerless and ignorant one is, and how one is upheld by an unseen hand, until, for an instant, that hand has seemed to close and to crush. Death has been imminent upon us. We know that at any moment it may be again. That grim presence shadows our lives, but who can deny that in that shadow the sense of duty, the feeling of sobriety and responsibility, the appreciation of the gravity and of the objects of life, the earnest desire to develop and improve, have grown and become real with us to a degree that has leavened our whole society from end to end. It is something beyond sex and beyond dogmas. It is rather an alteration of perspective, a shifting of our sense of proportion, a vivid realization that we are insignificant and evanescent creatures, existing on sufferance and at the mercy of the first chill wind from the unknown. But if the world has grown graver with this knowledge, it is not, I think, a sadder place in consequence. Surely we are agreed that the more sober and restrained pleasures of the present are deeper as well as wiser than the noisy, foolish hustle which passed so often for enjoyment in the days of old, days so recent and yet already so inconceivable. Those empty lives which were wasted in aimless visiting and being visited, in the worry of great and unnecessary households, in the arranging and eating of elaborate and tedious meals, have now found rest and health in the reading, the music, the gentle family communion which comes from a simpler and saner division of their time. With greater health and greater pleasure they are richer than before, even after they have paid those increased contributions to the common fund which have so raised the standard of life in these islands. There is some clash of opinion as to the exact hour of the great awakening. It is generally agreed that, apart from the difference of clocks, there may have been local causes which influenced the action of the poison. Certainly, in each separate district, the resurrection was practically simultaneous. There are numerous witnesses that Big Ben pointed to ten minutes past six at the moment. The astronomer Royal has fixed the Greenwich time at twelve past six. On the other hand, Laird Johnson, a very capable East Anglia observer, has recorded six-twenty as the hour. In the Hebrides it was as late as seven. In our own case there can be no doubt whatever, for I was seated in Challenger's study with his carefully tested chronometer in front of me at the moment. The hour was a quarter past six. An enormous depression was weighing upon my spirits. The cumulative effect of all the dreadful sights which we had seen upon our journey was heavy upon my soul. With my abounding animal health and great physical energy, any kind of mental clouding was a rare event. I had the Irish faculty of seeing some gleam of humour in every darkness. But now the obscurity was appalling and unrelieved. The others were downstairs making their plans for the future. I sat by the open window, my chin resting upon my hand, and my mind absorbed in the misery of our situation. Could we continue to live? That was the question which I had begun to ask myself. Was it possible to exist upon a dead world? Just as in physics the greater body draws to itself the lesser, would we not feel an overpowering attraction from that vast body of humanity which had passed into the unknown? How would the end come? Would it be from a return of the poison? Or would the earth be uninhabitable from the mephitic products of universal decay? Or, finally, might our awful situation prey upon and unbalance our minds? A group of insane folk upon a dead world! My mind was brooding upon this last dreadful idea, when some slight noise caused me to look down upon the road beneath me. The old cab-horse was coming up the hill! I was conscious at the same instant of the twittering of birds, of someone coughing in the yard below, and of a background of movement in the landscape. And yet I remember that it was that absurd, emaciated, superannuated cab-horse which held my gaze. 
Slowly and wheezily it was climbing the slope. Then my eye travelled to the driver sitting hunched up upon the box, and finally to the young man who was leaning out of the window in some excitement and shouting a direction. They were all indubitably, aggressively alive. Everybody was alive once more. Had it all been a delusion? Was it conceivable that this whole poison belt incident had been an elaborate dream? For an instant my startled brain was really ready to believe it. Then I looked down, and there was the rising blister on my hand where it was frayed by the rope of the city bell. It had really been so, then. And yet here was the world resuscitated. Here was life come back in an instant full tide to the planet. Now, as my eyes wandered all over the great landscape, I saw it in every direction, and moving, to my amazement, in the very same groove in which it had halted. There were the golfers. Was it possible that they were going on with their game? Yes, there was a fellow driving off from a tee, and that other group upon the green were surely putting for the hole. The reapers were slowly trooping back to their work. The nurse-girl slapped one of her charges, and then began to push the perambulator up the hill. Every one had unconcernedly taken up the thread at the very point where they had dropped it. I rushed downstairs, but the hall door was open, and I heard the voices of my companions, loud in astonishment and congratulation, in the yard. How we all shook hands and laughed as we came together, and how Mrs. Challenger kissed us all in her emotion, before she finally threw herself into the bear-hug of her husband. "'But they could not have been asleep!' cried Lord John. "'Dash it all, Challenger! You don't mean to believe that those folk were asleep with their staring eyes and stiff limbs, and that awful death-grin on their faces!' "'It can only have been the condition that is called catalepsy,' said Challenger. "'It has been a rare phenomenon in the past, and has constantly been mistaken for death. While it endures, the temperature falls, the respiration disappears, the heartbeat is indistinguishable. In fact, it is death, save that it is evanescent. Even the most comprehensive mind—' Here he closed his eyes and simpered could hardly conceive a universal outbreak of it in this fashion. "'You may label it catalepsy,' remarked Summerlee. "'But, after all, it is only a name, and we know as little of the truth as we do of the poison which has caused it. The most we can say is that the vitiated ether has produced a temporary death.' Austin was seated all in a heap on the step of the car. It was his coughing which I had heard from above. He had been holding his head in silence, but now he was muttering to himself, and running his eyes over the car. "'Young fathead,' he grumbled, "'can't leave things alone.' "'What's the matter, Austin?' "'Lubricator's left running, sir. Someone has been fooling with the car. I expect it's that young garden-boy, sir.' Lord John looked guilty. "'I don't know what's amiss with me,' continued Austin, staggering to his feet. "'I expect I came over queer when I was hosing her down. I seem to remember flopping over by the step. But I'll swear I never left those lubricator taps on.' In a condensed narrative the astonished Austin was told what had happened to himself and the world. The mystery of the dripping lubricators was also explained to him. He listened with an air of deep distrust when told how an amateur had driven his car, and with absorbed interest to the few sentences in which our experiences of the sleeping city were recorded. I can remember his comment when the story was concluded. "'Was you outside the Bank of England, sir?' "'Yes, Austin.' "'With all them millions inside, and everybody asleep?' "'That was so.' "'And I not there!' he groaned, and turned dismally once more to the hosing of his car. There was a sudden grinding of wheels upon gravel. The old cab had actually pulled up at Challenger's door. I saw the young occupant step out from it. An instant later the maid, 
who looked as tousled and bewildered as if she had that instant been aroused from the deepest sleep, appeared with a card upon a tray. Challenger snorted ferociously as he looked at it, and his thick black hair seemed to bristle up in his wrath. "'A pressman!' he growled. Then, with a deprecating smile, "'After all, it is natural that the whole world should hasten to know what I think of such an episode.' "'That can hardly be his errand,' said Summerlee, "'for he was on the road in his cab before ever the crisis came.' I looked at the card. James Baxter, London Correspondent, New York Monitor. "'You'll see him?' said I. "'Not I.' "'Oh, George, you should be kinder and more considerate to others. Surely you have learned something from what we have undergone?' He tut-tutted and shook his big obstinate head. "'A poisonous breed. Eh, Malone? The worst weed in modern civilization.' the ready tool of the quack, and the hindrance of the self-respecting man. When did they ever say a good word for me? When did you ever say a good word to them? I answered. Come, sir, this is a stranger who has made a journey to see you. I am sure that you won't be rude to him. Well, well, he grumbled, you come with me and do the talking. I protest in advance against any such outrageous invasion of my private life. Muttering and mumbling, he came rolling after me like an angry and rather ill-conditioned mastiff. The dapper young American pulled out his notebook and plunged instantly into his subject. "'I came down, sir,' said he, "'because our people in America would very much like to hear about this danger which is, in your opinion, pressing upon the world.' "'I know of no danger which is now pressing upon the world,' Challenger answered gruffly. The pressman looked at him in mild surprise. "'I meant, sir, the chances that the world might run into a belt of poisonous ether.' "'I do not now apprehend any such danger,' said Challenger. The pressman looked even more perplexed. "'You are Professor Challenger, are you not?' he asked. "'Yes, sir, that is my name.' I cannot understand, then, how you can say that there is no such danger. I am alluding to your own letter, published above your name in the London Times of this morning. It was Challenger's turn to look surprised. This morning, said he, no London Times was published this morning. Surely, sir, said the American, in mild remonstrance, you must admit that the London Times is a daily paper. He drew out a copy from his inside pocket. "'Here is the letter to which I refer.' Challenger chuckled and rubbed his hands. "'I begin to understand,' said he. "'So you read this letter this morning?' "'Yes, sir.' "'And came at once to interview me?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Did you observe anything unusual upon the journey down?' "'Well,' To tell the truth, your people seem more lively and generally human than I have ever seen them. The baggage man set out to tell me a funny story, and that's a new experience for me in this country. Nothing else? Why, no, sir, not that I can recall. Well, now, what hour did you leave Victoria? The American smiled. I came here to interview you, Professor, but it seems to be a case of is this nigger fishin', or is this fish niggerin'? You're doing most of the work. It happens to interest me. Do you recall the hour? Sure. It was half-past twelve. And you arrived? At a quarter-past two. And you hired a cab? That was so. How far do you suppose it is to the station? Well, I should reckon the best part of two miles. So how long do you think it took you? Well, half an hour, maybe, with that asthmatic in front. So it should be three o'clock? Yes, or a trifle after it. Look at your watch. The American did so, and then stared at us in astonishment. Say, he cried, it's run down. That horse has broken every record, sure. The sun is pretty low. 
now that I come to look at it, well, there's something here I don't understand. Have you no remembrance of anything remarkable as you came up the hill? Well, I seem to recollect that I was mighty sleepy once. It comes back to me that I wanted to say something to the driver, and that I couldn't make him heed me. I guess it was the heat, but I felt swimmy for a moment. That's all. So it is with the whole human race, said Challenger to me. They have all felt swimmy for a moment. None of them have as yet any comprehension of what has occurred. Each will go on with his interrupted job as Austin has snatched up his hose-pipe, or the golfer continued his game. Your editor, Malone, will continue the issue of his papers, and very much amazed he will be at finding that an issue is missing. Yes, my young friend, he added to the American reporter, with a sudden mood of amused geniality, it may interest you to know that the world has swum through the poisonous current which swirls like the Gulf Stream through the ocean of ether. You will also kindly note for your own future convenience that to-day is not Friday, August the 27th, but Saturday, August the 28th, and that you sat senseless in your cab for twenty-eight hours upon the Rutherford Hill. And, right here, as my American colleague would say, I may bring this narrative to an end. It is, as you are probably aware, only a fuller and more detailed version of the account which appeared in the Monday edition of the Daily Gazette, an account which has been universally admitted to be the greatest journalistic scoop of all time, which sold no fewer than three and a half million copies of the paper. Framed upon the wall of my sanctum, I retain those magnificent headlines. Twenty-eight hours world coma. Unprecedented experience. Challenger justified. Our correspondent escapes. Enthralling narrative. The oxygen room. Weird motor drive. Dead London. Replacing the missing page. Great fires and loss of life. Will it recur? Underneath this glorious scroll came nine and a half columns of narrative, in which appeared the first, last, and only account of the history of the planet, so far as one observer could draw it, during one long day of its existence. Challenger and Summerlee have treated the matter in a joint scientific paper, but to me alone was left the popular account. Surely I can sing Nunc Dimittis. What is left but anticlimax in the life of a journalist after that? But let me not end on sensational headlines and a merely personal triumph. Rather let me quote the sonorous passages in which the greatest of daily papers ended its admirable leader upon the subject, a leader which might well be filed for reference by every thoughtful man. It has been a well-worn truism, said the Times that our human race are a feeble folk before the infinite latent forces which surround us. From the prophets of old and from the philosophers of our own time, the same message and warning have reached us. But, like all oft-repeated truths, it has in time lost something of its actuality and cogency. A lesson, an actual experience, was needed to bring it home. It is from that salutary but terrible ordeal that we have just emerged, with minds which are still stunned by the suddenness of the blow, and with spirits which are chastened by the realization of our own limitations and impotence. The world has paid a fearful price for its schooling. Hardly yet have we learned the full tale of disaster, but the destruction of fire of New York, of Orleans, and of Brighton constitutes in itself one of the greatest tragedies in the history of our race. When the account of the railway and shipping accidents has been completed, it will furnish grim reading, although there is evidence to show that in the vast majority of cases the drivers of trains and engineers of steamers succeeded in shutting off their motive power before succumbing to the poison. But the material damage, enormous as it is both in life and in property, is not the consideration which will be uppermost in our minds to-day. All this may in time be forgotten, but what will not be forgotten? 
and what will and should continue to obsess our imaginations, is this revelation of the possibilities of the universe, this destruction of our ignorant self-complacency, and this demonstration of how narrow is the path of our material existence, and what abysses may lie upon either side of it. Solemnity and humility are at the base of all our emotions to-day. May they be the foundations upon which a more earnest and reverent race may build a more worthy temple. 